This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Why do colleges still have vaccine mandates? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason, joined by my co-host, Liz Wolf, Reason Associate Editor and author of the Daily Reason Roundup, which you should be getting delivered to your inbox every morning. At least 40 U.S. colleges still require a COVID vaccine, according to NoCollegeMandates.com, which is an initiative that tracks and opposes such mandates. And our guest today is Martin Koldorf, a professor of medicine and biostatistician who lost his job at Harvard for refusing the vaccine, even though he'd already survived a COVID infection. Harvard has since dropped its mandate, but Koldorf likely will not be getting his job there back anytime soon for reasons we'll discuss shortly. Uh, Koldorf created one of the earliest disease outbreak surveillance software systems and was also booted from the COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Commission, regularly de-boosted on Twitter for his views, and was one of the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration that prompted former NIH Director Francis Collins to label him and his co-signers fringe epidemiologists and call for a quick and devastating takedown. So today we're going to talk with him about his ordeal at Harvard, his retrospective on the pandemic and the cultural and governmental response to it, and his involvement in the Supreme Court case Murthy v. Missouri, in which plaintiffs argue that federal agencies violated the First Amendment by pressuring social media companies to take down certain content about COVID-19. Martin Koldorf, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. What happened between you and Harvard? Well, I don't think they were quite happy with me when I was out walking against the lockdowns uh, and school closures and instead favoring uh, uh, focused protection, doing better protection of all the people who are at the high risk. Uh, And uh, when uh, I I had COVID, uh, I was hospitalized for it and uh, I have an autoimmune disease. So there was no need for me to get the vaccine uh, nor would I protect others by taking the vaccine? Uh, so uh, they didn't like that either. So they said goodbye. So was you mentioned you had an autoimmune disease. Was that part of your reason for not wanting to follow up with a vaccine after your infection? It's not an autoimmune disease. It's an immune deficiency. Yeah. So it's called oh, alpha-1 okay. antigen deficiency, which makes me mm-hmm. sensitive to infections. Since as, it's a, any other genetic thing, so... Okay. Um, I, I reached out to, so I just, to, I was trying to understand the dynamics of Harvard and correct me if I'm wrong, but you were working at Mass Brigham Hospital, which is affiliated with Harvard. And they seem to be the ones who have the vaccine requirement. And I emailed them to ask, you know, first of all, to confirm, like, were you all the ones that fired Martin Koldorf? And if so, would you hire him back now that, you know, COVID is, you know, pe- people have had access to the vaccine for years now? Um, and yes, they confirmed that uh, your employment at Mass General Brigham was terminated. Um and that faculty positions at the medical school are contingent upon employment at Harvard affiliated at a Harvard affiliated academic medical center. Um, and then that there's a continuing primary series requirement, which affects new hi- hires. It amounts to receiving the latest COVID vaccine if the new hire has not received a COVID vaccine in the past. So I guess the bottom line here is that if you're uh, an undergraduate or a faculty member at Harvard, you don't have to get the vaccine, but there's a kind of special situation here for people affiliated with the medical program. Is there anything else you can add to that understanding? Uh, yeah, so that was partly news to me, but uh, uh, that they still have that requirement. Uh, but it's very unscientific because having recovered from uh, COVID, I have better immunity against COVID than people who just had the vaccine. Right. 
Uh, well, why, uh, yeah, why, go ahead, would it, why would it still be in place in April 2024? It's not clear to me what the point is, given that we're at a point where pretty much everybody has had COVID. Uh, I agree with that question, and I don't have an answer to it because I don't think there is a good answer to it. But I mean, in your scientific and medical understanding, you know, is there any steel man case for why they're requiring this? Or is it just entirely, you know, because they always have, and so they're digging their heels in and, you know, continuing to force people to get this vaccine when in reality, there's not much utility? Yeah, so there's no scientific reason for it or public health reasons or patient safety reasons to have this mandate in place. Uh, so it's probably inertia or unwillingness to uh, admit that uh, the vaccine mandates were both unscientific and unethical to begin with. And I say they are unscientific because uh, we've known since 430 BC during the Athenian plague two and a half thousand years ago that if you have recovered from an infectious disease, you have immunity. Sometimes it's permanent immunity for a lifetime like these cells, and sometimes it just protects you from severity of disease the next time you get infected, which is the case for coronaviruses, including the four previous ones. So uh, there's no, uh, and we know, we knew very early on in 2020 that if you had COVID, you had uh, immunity that protected you from uh, for, uh, later. You can still get it again, as with all other coronaviruses, but you're still protected. So it's not scientific for that reason, but it's also very unethical because uh, let's, for the sake of argument, assume that this is the best vaccine ever. 100% uh, efficacy, it doesn't have that, but let's just assume it and no side effects. There are side effects, but let's assume it's just the perfect thing. Then uh, with COVID, there's more than a thousand for difference in mortality among the old and the young. So to force people that are young or to force people who have already had COVID, who have immunity, to get the vaccine when there are a lot of people, including my 87-year-old neighbor, who hadn't gotten the vaccine. That's very unethical because you're deprived, there was a shortage of vaccines. You're depriving the vaccine from people who need it and who benefit from it by forcing mandating to people who don't need it. So it's very unethical and very bad public health policy to have these mandates on people that don't need a vaccine when there are people uh, out there that haven't gotten it, but do, who do need it because they're at very high risk. Yeah, so I, I think wonder... that what Brigham, what Harvard's Mass General Brigham and Harvard University did by this mandate was highly unethical uh, uh, and very bad for public health. A great example of that, you know, is the vaccination of children. I'm still struck by how, to this day, as a New York City parent, when I take my toddler to the pediatrician. There's frequently the suggestion that he gets a COVID vaccine and the implication that this is very, very important. And I wonder for parents who were receiving this pressure from the city of New York during peak pandemic, um, when the vaccine was beginning to be rolled out, it doesn't really make sense to be vaccinating a one and a half year old boy compared to, you know, my elderly in-laws. Um, that was always a component to this that's sort of bizarre when we know, in fact, that thankfully this is not particularly dangerous to children or rather the, va the, the, the virus itself is not particularly dangerous to children. The vaccine certainly carries some risk for, you know, boys of, of a certain age. You're a hundred percent right. So when you look at any vaccine or any drug for that matter, you have to look at the benefits and the potential risks. So for all the people who have a high risk of dying from COVID back in 2021, uh, if they hadn't had COVID already, uh, they maybe had a 1% risk of dying. And then even if there's a small risk from the vaccine, it's still worth taking it because the benefits uh, outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. But for children or young adults, we know that the risk of dying from COVID is minuscule. So, uh, and it's less than the, than the average influenza year during the last decades, where usually about 200 to 1,000 kids every year die from influenza, depending on the severity. So COVID has less risk than the typical historical influenza season. Mm. And then to give a, a vaccine to a child with very minuscule risk, so you know the benefit is very, very small at best, mm -hmm. but you don't know what the risks are. Uh, now we know it because we know that the risk of, for example, myocarditis, which is the inflammation of the heart, uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, especially among uh, teenage uh, boys and young men. Uh, so uh, we know there are some risks. So I don't think I don't think people, children should get this vaccine. Uh, and I think also basically forcing this vaccine or trying to force it on people just make parents skeptical about the other vaccines like measles, which is actually a very important vaccine. I want to uh, back up for a second uh, and then I want to return to what we know and don't know about vaccines at this point. But um, I want to, you know, n- now there's a little bit, there, there feels like a little m- more breathing room to talk about these issues. People aren't quite as heated as they were maybe two or three years ago. Uh, first of all, when when did your um, relationship with Harvard, when was that severed? Uh, what, what's the timeline here? So uh, uh, Harvard's National Brigham fired me uh, a little bit two years ago. Okay. And it's- then Harvard Medical School put me on leave for two years. Wow. And then uh, they uh, ended that leave uh, at the end of last year. Okay. So we're talking about uh, 2022. What was it like? You know, p- people have a certain perception of Harvard and what the culture of Harvard is like. What was it like for you at that time uh, being a sort of dissident uh, among the Harvard faculty? Like, w- what was that experience like? In 2022. So, so among my colleagues that I work with like on a regular basis uh, doing research with, I had no problems. I would say the majority of them were in favor of focus protection and were skeptical school closures and stuff like that. So I had absolutely no problems with any of the people I work with on a regular basis. Uh, the leaderships of Harvard's Mass General Brigham did not like, for example, when I uh, did interviews with uh, about the Great Barrington Declaration, so they were they were not so happy, and there were others mm-hmm. who were also unhappy. Uh, when two of my colleagues tried to arrange, this was in 2020, uh, late 2020, they tried to arrange like a debate between me and some of my colleagues who were in favor of school closures and lockdowns. Uh, so two of them tried to arrange a debate, but there was no takers on the other side. So I said yes, of course. But Wait, there, there were no more... takers on the other side? No, they didn't want to debate me. But was the, they were making was that like law a... off the land. I don't understand how you could possibly you know, force a policy into place and then not feel comfortable defending it in a public forum. Yeah, to me, that's kind of shocking. Yeah. And when people wonder who they should trust when it comes to public health, I think one criteria is if, if, some, if there's a scientist who's not willing to debate other scientists about it, then you shouldn't trust them. Yeah, this is, uh, it was, it's a strange time to reflect on because you are ensconced in this world um, and suddenly because of some of these views you articulated, you were pushed to the fringes. I mean, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, Francis Collins labeling you and Jay Bhattacharya and the other signers of the document fringe epidemiologists and suddenly becoming untouchable. Like we can't even debate him. You can't even quote unquote platform him. I mean, you were part of uh, the COVID-19 vaccine safety working group here. I've got your name highlighted among a list of, you know, uh, luminaries here. Uh, and you were booted off that. Uh, tell me about that experience. Why were you booted out of this? Like, what did this group do? And why were you booted out of it? So this was set up actually in early 2020, before there were any vaccine on the market, to to evaluate the safety of the COVID vaccines once they were approved. So the post-marketing surveillance. Uh, so it's an important thing to do. Uh, you want to monitor the safety after it's approved to see if there are any unexpected serious events. Uh, looking at, for example, anaphylaxis and myocarditis and other things. And I was uh, fired from this committee, uh, not for the reason you might think, but the opposite. I was fired because I was too pro-vaccine. Hmm. So in really? the spring of 2020, CDC, there were reports of some blood clots in older women after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So that's the vaccine that's not the mRNA. mRNA is the Pfizer and Moderna, and this was the third vaccine, which is a, an inovirus vector vaccine. Uh, so uh, 
there were some blood clots uh, in all the women. And CDC decided to take a pause on this vaccine. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was, well, sorry, sorry, the blood clots was in younger women under 50 only. There was none among the older women. So uh, it was, I think it was reasonable to put a pause among younger women because they are so low risk for mortality anyhow that they don't really are in great need of this vaccine. Uh, but I objected to making the pause for older people because mm-hmm. this was the one dose vaccine. Uh, it was the non-mRNA vaccine, so some people feel more comfortable with it. Um, a one-dose vaccine important for like rural areas that are hard to reach people or homeless people that you may only be able to reach once. Uh, so a two-dose vaccine is more difficult there. And at the time, there was a shortest of vaccines. So not everybody who needed it were getting it. So your so, logic was essentially that, you know, if for a woman, you know, I'm a 27-year-old woman, uh, if we were in, you know, vaccination time in 2021, you're, you were basically positing, okay, Liz should not receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, if at all possible, but a 75-year-old homeless man in an encampment somewhere probably should receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, because that's sort of the best means to get him vaccinated and he's higher risk. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Okay. So Perfectly that seems correct. like a really appropriate sort of like, like it seems like your lens through which you were looking at all of this was just cost benefit. It was just cost benefit analysis for every single type of case. And that was seen as inappropriate to them or, or what was their objection to that? Yeah, so I didn't think that the discussions, the internal discussions were very fruitful. So I decided to write an op-ed in The Hill arguing against the pause for older Americans. And they were not happy about that. So that's why I was fired from the committee. Wow. Now, uh, it's, four days it's, after they fired me, they dropped the, the pause on it. So they, they did implement what I really? suggested. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, they were like not the happy that red. I went out uh, uh, arguing. Uh, inf- so, so I'm probably the only one who has ever been fired by CDC for being too pro-vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the common thread to both of these scenarios um, is basically these organizations wanting to save face. It's not even that you're wrong. It's that they don't want to admit that you're correct. And you have to follow the the narrative, the established yeah. narrative. Mm. And if you don't, uh, uh, you, uh, you're a pariah. And to me, that doesn't make any sense because if I serve on the advisory committee for the CDC, I'm there to give... Uh, as good as advice as I can about these things. And if I feel that I have to follow the narrative, I'm pretty useless. So everybody who's on that committee who just feel that they have to follow whatever CDC wants are not really serving any purpose on that committee. Hmm. So, if I don't, I, 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 so I say freely what I think is, 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 is accurate based on, uh, on uh, my scientific knowledge. Uh, and, If I didn't do that, I wouldn't do what I was supposed to do on that committee. The other strange thing is I've no, I noticed this throughout the pandemic. It it's present in what Liz was bringing up with the attitude towards vaccinating children. It's evident in this example you just gave of maybe the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is still appropriate for some groups, but not other groups. It seemed like there was a real resistance to doing any sort of stratification uh, in like saying that certain vaccines are good for certain demographics and certain vaccines aren't ideal for certain demographics. There was never that level of like nuance or granularity, at least from my perspective, just as a in for semi-informed consumer, I never saw it like broken down to that level. Like, what should I, as a you know, at the time, thirty-seven-year-old, relatively healthy guy, be doing? It was never broken down to that level. Why didn't that ever happen? Uh, yeah, that's a huge problem because that's not how you should do public health or science. Uh, there are certain drugs or vaccines that are suitable for some people and not others. And there was a general problem, I think, during the uh, uh, during the pandemic that uh, people were ignoring the fact that while anybody can get infected, that there's more than a thousand fold difference in the risk of dying. So, uh, and also, of course, uh, ignoring infection acquired or natural immunity. 
So uh, people just wanted to treat everybody the same, and that doesn't make any sense in this scenario. Yeah. There was also the, you know, you talked about how you're, I, there's something about your personality where you are just going to keep saying what you think despite these consequences. Um, and that's the, the consequences were not just getting kicked out of Harvard or uh, booted off this committee, but also actually having your voice deboosted online. Um, one of the tweets that we've pulled here was you weighing in on this question of children and vaccines on Twitter before it was transformed into X. This was in March 2021. You said you're replying to somebody who's saying that younger people should get vaccinated and you you say no. Thinking that everyone must be vaccinated is as scientifically flawed as thinking nobody should. COVID vaccines are important for older high-risk people and their caretakers. Those with prior natural infection do not need it, nor children. And then you've got a little notification under there. This tweet is misleading. Learn why health officials recommend a vaccine for most people and nobody was allowed to share or like that. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, reflect a little bit about that period of time, the the old version of Twitter and what it was like um, trying to communicate uh, uh, under that, that kind of regime. Well, first of all, I think what I said there is true. So uh, I don't think it was misleading, I think, and I think uh, it has been confirmed to be true. Uh, but it's, it's shocking to me uh, that I'm a scientist and I'm saying simple, basic uh, public health facts. Mm -hmm. And that that's being censored because uh, it contradicts something that the government uh, thought, which actually turned out to be wrong. Uh, so uh, if you had told me f uh, four years ago that I would be... Uh, uh, censored, uh, I would have thought you were crazy. That could never happen. They would censor uh, scientists. And of course, this is true information that uh, that uh, Twitter censored. And and in this particular case, we know it was at the behest of the government because the government funded this uh, uh, entity at Stanford called the Variety Project. So they funded the, funded them to go after. Uh, certain things on social media that the government didn't like. And it was the Variety Project who contacted Twitter and said, please uh, do something about this tweet. So we know there was a, a clear link from the, from the federal government to pressure the social media companies to uh, remove uh, uh, what in this case was true information. Now, I think that f the First Amendment rights is, is important whether the information is true or false. So if you want to claim that the earth is flat, you should be allowed to do that. Nobody should censor you for, for saying that. Uh, but uh, in this case, the, the, the social media companies censored accurate information at the behest of the federal government. And to me, that's kind of shocking. And it wasn't just Twitter. It's also, I was censored by YouTube, which is owned by Google. I was censored by LinkedIn, which is owned by yeah. Microsoft. And I was censored by Facebook. So. I've actually got that. I've got, I've got that clip of you being uh, of the YouTube uh, takedown as well. This is where you appeared in March of 2021 with uh, Governor Florida Governor Ron DeSantis doing a roundtable discussion uh, with uh, some other epidemiologists. Jay Bhattacharya was there. Um, let's roll that clip because that's another one worth reflecting on now in the rear view mirror of 2024. Let's see, like, how bad was what you were saying in this roundtable? Uh, Ian, could you roll that clip? These lockdowns and uh, contact tracing in mass, they were not able to prevent uh, uh, a, a resurgence of the disease during the winter. And the problem is that the belief that the pandemic could be suppressed through these lockdowns meant that in a lot of places in the world, people did not use focus protections of the old. They thought that the lockdowns would protect the old, but they didn't. So they didn't put in the, the standard public health message to actually properly protect the older high-risk people. And I think that's very tragic and it has uh, led to uh, many unnecessary deaths among uh, our older citizens. For all people, have to be very careful because this is more dangerous than the annual influenza. But for children, 
This is less dangerous than annual influenza. So we should have utilized that feature of, the, uh, of COVID to protect the old with focused protection while letting younger people live normal life to avoid all the collateral public health damage from the lockdown, which are enormous. Uh, Dr. Gupta mentioned about, you know, not putting masks on kids, that's not effective, not necessary. Uh, Martin Calder, do you agree in school, there's no, no need to, for them to be wearing face masks? Uh, children should not wear face masks, no. There's, uh, they don't need it for their own protection and they don't need it for protecting other people either. I believe that was that last comment that uh, angered the YouTube moderators um, spreading misinformation about children and masks. Um, you know, reflecting on all that now, is there anything you would change or say differently, or do you pretty much stand by all that? I stand by it. And I think uh, uh, this issue with masks is actually very problematic because we know from, from randomized trials, from one from Denmark and one that was done in Bangladesh, that uh, uh, the protection for masks is either zero or minuscule. Uh, the Danish study find no benefit, and the Bangladesh study found a benefit between reducing it by between zero and eighteen percent, which is almost nothing uh, or nothing. So, uh, the, actually, the fact that people were told that the mask would protect them is actually very dangerous to do. It's a very bad public health messaging. Because you then have people, like older people, let's say the 75-year-old man that Liz was talking about, he may be, oh, okay, I like to go to this crowded restaurant, but uh, yeah, I'll put on the mask, and everybody's wearing masks, it'll be safe. Well, that's not the case. During the height of the pandemic, a 75-year-old man should not be in a crowded restaurant. So it's dangerous. But then you told people, well, wear a mask and be safe. That's then a very dangerous, they give sort of a, self, a false sense of protection. And then, so I think people actually died because they were falsely told that the masks would protect them. So when it, when they didn't, so that's very dangerous uh, public health measures thing to do. So they shouldn't have done that. What, what did you? What was your reaction when you heard that that roundtable with the sitting governor of the third largest state in the U.S. was taken down off YouTube? Yeah, I think that was. Uh, Again, shocking because uh, you even censor a governor, a, a elected governor of a, of a state. Uh, but that's also related to uh, LinkedIn, for example. I, I retweeted or I reposted uh, something. I didn't add anything on myself. I just reposted something that was said by the, uh, the state technologist of Iceland, which is sort of the equivalent of the CDC director for Iceland. And that was censored. So they even censored the official views by uh, a, a foreign government uh, official. So it's clear that uh, they were willing to censor anybody who uh, said anything against the official narrative. And I think the reason they did it is that they didn't have any arguments. If they had had good arguments, they would use those in a debate and explain things. Since they didn't, they had to do either censoring or slandering, and they did both of those things. In retrospect, reflecting on the last four years, from my perspective, it looks like the greatest cover-up that the U.S. government has conducted in a very long time. It looks as if there, you know, was initially really bad guidance, maybe a poor understanding of how this virus operates. Certainly, bad public health guidance instructing people to, you know, get away from one another, to socially distance, to lock themselves inside of their homes, to refrain from going to work. Very little messaging as to which groups are most at risk and very little tailoring of the lockdown guidance um, to protect those who are most in need of it, but then to allow the rest of people to sort of go about their lives, you know, in a relatively normal manner. And then the thing that's been really shocking to me is the fact that there was dissent. There were people like you, there was the Great Barrington Declaration. There were sort of sane and rational people who were saying, hey, from the epidemiological and scientific perspective, this is not quite right. Uh, the government is erring. And then there were lots of people talking from the public policy perspective and saying, hey, our children are not learning well at home. It is actually really, really important that we get children back into a communal learning environment. And all of these people at all of these different levels were sort of systematically targeted and fired, dismissed from their posts or deplatformed 
over and over again. And then even now, there's still not some sort of widespread mea culpa or even necessarily a shared understanding of what we lived through. There's more of this sense of, at least I think for maybe half of the population or some smaller percentage, there's a sense of how dare our government do this to us? How is it that we had this sort of like mass, um, you know, psychotic break or so it feels where there's still no atonement for it? And then for maybe half of the population, it's kind of a, you know, yeah, that was bad, but we had to do that. And maybe if something like that happens again, we'll do it all over again. To me, that feels just shocking that we don't have a more collective understanding of what went down. How does it look to you? I agree. Um, we have had commissions for things like the, uh, the when, when something happened, like the space shuttle, there was a commission for the 9-11, there was a commission for and so on. So obviously we should have a commission for the pandemic response. Uh, I think the reason we do, and they started to work on it actually, but then when they realized that what was done was such a catastrophe, they just closed down the plans for a commission. So right now there's no uh, commission at the federal level. There are there is one in New Hampshire uh, that just started, and uh, uh, I believe that Florida has a grand jury investigation that published something about a month or two ago, uh, like the first report. So there are some at the state level, but not at the federal level. I, I should also say that, I mean, I guess you can claim that you didn't know about enough about public health, you didn't know what was going on, but this thing of censoring and our, our First Amendment free speech rights that should never be accepted by anybody. And to me, that's actually a shock that there are people who think that it's okay to violate the First Amendment. The government shouldn't be allowed to do that, but also the social media companies, even on their own, they shouldn't do that. They should ha have free speech. And the one who suffers most is not me, but when I'm censored, I think the people who suffer are the public who can't hear different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And if you can, and of course I know about the pandemic, but the other things I don't know about, and I don't want them to censor you so that I can hear what you have to say. So free speech is not only about protecting the right to speak, it's also to protecting the right for people to hear different views. Also, yeah. I want to be able to listen to a voice like yours more so than I want to listen to Alex Jones, right? And so in a position, in a situation where Twitter has decided to you know, bring down its wrath um, at the behest of the government on a voice like yours, that makes it so people like me suddenly are more incentivized to turn to voices that are far less trustworthy, right? And, you know, going down these deeper alternative rabbit holes, um, I think frequently lead people astray. And so it's crazy that it's like the sort of sane, rational middle ground that is so frequently cracked down on. And that doesn't necessarily mean that people's questioning will be stifled. It just means that they'll feel a sense of like, okay, well, where should I find this information now? I guess, I don't know, like, Alex Jones, isn't there something better than that, right? It's either like traditional establishment or alt voices, and there's kind of no appropriate middle ground. And I think frequently it's that middle ground that's really speaking a lot of truth. Yeah, and I think the reason is that those of us who are out there, like sort of the scientists, we are more of a threat to the narrative than some other person who is yeah. whoever they are. Mm. So we are more of a threat, and therefore we are more likely maybe to be censored. Yeah. Let me ask you, uh, let me try to put forth, do my best to channel like the best argument of the, so the censorious social media executive who's managing Facebook or Twitter during a pandemic where people are dying and they're thinking, you know what, um, there's a lot of quacks out there and we, you know, I think all of us here can acknowledge now that, um, you know, you and, and Jay Bhattacharya had a lot to say that was worth listening to, but during um, this pandemic and possibly future pandemics, there will be legitimately bad or, you know, dangerously ill-informed people out there. Um, and so there's a responsibility to stop just blatant nonsense from spreading around. Um, should they have like should they even attempt that project uh, or um like did they just do a, a bad job at it how, how do you think about like the real the real bad actors in in this space like what should social media companies do about that 
So during the pandemic, I was actually in two different roles uh, in the U.S. where I live and in Sweden. I'm a native of Sweden. I was born and raised there. And I just I participated in the discussions and the debates both in Sweden and the U.S. Uh, and in the U.S., I was on the fringe, as Francis Collins said. In the Sweden, I was in the majority because Sweden mm -hmm. was the only major Western country that didn't close all the schools and lock down and so on and did focus protection. So I was in favor of the Swedish government of their approach to the pandemic. Uh, and of course, we now know that that turned out better because uh, Sweden has the lowest excess mortality of all. Major yeah, let Western me bring countries. up a couple slides. This is, these are a couple slides from uh, we spoke with Johan Norberg, who did a study on this. This is showing the COVID death rate not being an outlier. It's right in the middle of the pack in Europe. And then you were talking about excess deaths. There it is all the way at the bottom uh, for Europe. So Sweden, you know, <laughs> took a lot of hits uh, in the media and from our government officials while it was taking a different path. But at the end of the day, it seems as though Sweden fared just fine, even better than average on uh, some metrics. Yeah, they did well on COVID and did much better avoiding some of the collateral damage on public health. Right the cardiovascular disease and cancer and uh, mental health and so on. So in Sweden, I was on the majority. I was arguing for the establishment view, but there were a group of scientists, uh, they were called the group of 22. There was uh, there was one infectious disease technologist, but then also like a mathematician and oncologist and a, a climate scientist and so on. They were very much against what, uh, they were arguing very forcefully against the Swedish approach and Anders Tegnell, what he was proposing. Uh, wanting to have lockdowns like in the rest of the country or the world. Now, they published in the major newspapers in Sweden their uh, objections to the Swedish approach. And I completely disagree with what they said, but I'm very grateful that they did write it because I think that was important. Mm -hmm. Because obviously there were other people in Sweden who would have thinking the same thing. Maybe we should do it like the other countries. So it was very important to have that debate. So, very, so I think they did a huge service to Sweden by actually writing what they did. And then I responded to them in the same newspapers and other, uh, the Anders Tegnell, who's the chief technologist, responded and other scientists responded. Uh, and we could then explain to the public, well, this is the reason why we agree with this 22 and why it's better to do it the way it's being done. Uh, so this is an example, I think, where free speech actually operates the way it should be. Uh, so again, I disagree with what they said, but I'm very thankful. I think it was a very good thing that they actually wrote this thing, that yeah. they took the time to write that thing. So I'm very grateful that they did so. Did we notice yeah, a mean, shift in public opinion as a result of that public duking it out? Uh, yeah, so... We did notice a, a, a trust in the public health authority of Sweden. So Sweden, the Swedish public, both from surveys and talking to friends and family, were very confident in the approach that Sweden took. So there was never mm -hmm. any uh, sort of serious public efforts to uh, to do it like other countries. So they had they had throughout very very high public trust. But it's and that, that trust went into... both way. That trust went both way because the public health authority also trusted the public. Yeah. Is some of that baked into the Swedish DNA though? I mean it's a little bit more of a conformist culture <laughs> than individualistic USA. Uh I think More that uh, if you read Swedish children's books uh by Astrid Lindgren and others, mm -hmm. uh children are often allowed to be a little bit mischievous and uh, in in a good hearted <laughs> way. Uh, that's sort of the 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 ideal thing that children should not just obey, but should actually uh, do things that are a little bit mischievous. Uh, and I think that that has led to a society where you can't fool around them too much. They don't want, they won't just obey. So you have to really convince them that this is good. Hmm. For them to do you think, I was not expecting think... Pippi Longstocking to somehow be brought in to have this like useful Scandinavian insight, um, but you, you did it. You really, yeah, yeah, you yeah. spread that pretty well. <laughs> um, I mean, was your was being from Sweden and just like having a special interest in what was going on there? Do you think that was a major factor in that that led you to? look at things a little bit differently um is was that did that somehow 
cause you to swerve from the kind of consensus path? So I came to the same conclusion as Sweden did, independent of Sweden. Okay. Uh, but it did give me some sanity that there was that I could read the Swedish newspapers. That right. and I was and I was afraid that Sweden would buckle under the international pressure because it was enormous pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, the UK first also had the same sensible approach like Sweden, and then Boris Johnson buckled, and they completely mm -hmm. shifted. So that was a disappointment, and I was afraid that Sweden would do the same. So that's why I became active in the Swedish debate. And then we saw uh, uh, Sweden didn't close the schools for ages 1 to 15 during that whole wave during the spring of 2020. And the data was clear that if you look at the mortality data, those 1.8 million children exactly zero died from COVID. And there was only a few hospitalizations. And if you looked at teachers, they were at, at uh, no higher risk than other professions. So it was obvious uh, after the spring of 2020 from the Swedish data that uh, we should open all the schools here in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, and that was one of the things that I had the Twitter account with maybe a few hundred followers at the time. I was I was maybe posting two or three times a year only. So I figured, okay, I'll try to use this. I can't publish in the U.S. media, which I tried but failed. Mm. I'll use to use Twitter. So I was sort of putting out this report from the Swedish Public Health Agency that came out in early July showing that it was safe to have the schools open. I was trying to post as much as possible. And most of the time, it didn't reach anybody. A few times, some people saw it. But I found out later that Twitter had put me on a trans blacklist so I had to avoid that this information came out. Yeah. There, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's... It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of shocking that you wouldn't even look at Sweden. Uh, and that was at the highest level because the New England Journal of Medicine, which is edited by Harvard professors, they published a piece uh, at the end of July uh, talking about whether schools should be open or not uh, by two Harvard professors. And uh, they didn't even mention Sweden. And that's not how you find the truth, because if you do a drug trial, uh, then you have the pe some people get the drug and then so you have some uh, placebo control group. Mm -hmm. So to ignore Sweden is like ignoring the control group. Yeah. That's, As that's not how you find what's going on. As a sauna and cold plunger, I want to attribute Sweden's good outcomes to the overall <laughs> health trends of the country and the fact that overall in Scandinavia, I mean, we're talking a particularly healthy demographic with perhaps the notable exception of the Danes who chain smoke and eat way too much sugar and have way too much obesity, right? Like the Danes are off doing God knows what. But the rest of Scandinavia sort of has the right idea with the exception of like Finnish alcoholics. Um, but maybe that's just a self-serving hypothesis. Do you think that there's any any truth to that type of thing of like the actual population that we're talking about looks very different than the population that we're talking about in the United States? So a good health system obviously is, is helps when it comes to keeping down the COVID death. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't do anything when you look at excess death. Yeah. Because in, uh, you look at excess death, you compare the death rates during the pandemic with the death based to three prior are. years or the five prior years. Yeah. So obviously Sweden had a good health system before the pandemic and a good health system during the pandemic. If you compare that with Bulgaria, which has very high excess death, they don't have as good a health system before or during. Yeah. But when you do look at excess death, that sort of cancels out because mm. you compare yeah. Sweden to now uh, during the pandemic to this before. So uh, to me that that makes it's not because of the, the health system that Sweden has lower excess deaths. It's because it didn't do the lockdowns. Hmm. Uh, so it doesn't have the collateral damage on these other public health issues like cancer or cardiovascular disease hmm. or diabetes or, or, uh, or mental health. And I'm... the other Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Finland, Norway, also low because they also didn't, they closed the schools in the spring of 2020 but they had much less uh, lockdowns and closures than the rest of Europe. Hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting to me. I am going to continue to believe that it's um, cold plunges that result in overall good health, <laughs> though, just because it's a very self-serving thing for me personally. I, I want to re uh, return to the social media question for a second, because uh, you, you're involved, you're a named plaintiff in this case, uh, Murthy v. Missouri, which is in front of the Supreme Court right now. Um, and it raises some really thorny questions. I mean, there, there is 
undoubtedly something has gone wrong if serious academics trying to engage in a serious academic debate are being blacklisted on Twitter um, and the government is in any way involved with that. Um, we've come to call this job owning where the government's kind of exerts this like vague threat to get what it wants out of the social media companies. Um, the question then, the legal question in this case is really, where is that line between the government kind of just communicating and giving, sharing ideas with uh, tech companies and where does it come into coercion? Um, do you have any thoughts on that question? Like how, how much uh, freedom do you think there should be between the government and tech companies to be able to communicate and, you know, share information about public health, for instance? I think the government should communicate with social media companies with this illegal content. Okay. Uh, because that's illegal, that should be taken down. There are certain content that is illegal and uh, social media sh companies should do something about that. Uh, I don't think the federal government should communicate with them with other things. If they object to what I have to say, uh, they should write a response on Twitter or uh, go out with a news uh, press release or whatever to argue against it or set up a debate with it. So, for example, when Francis Collin, the former NIH director, re requested this uh, devastating uh, takedown, uh, he should instead have invited us to have a debate with other scientists to, uh, to discuss this. And in my mind, it's this during a crisis, when the pandemic was a crisis, that's when we need the First Amendment the most. Mm -hmm. uh, if everything is fine, then, well, First Amendment is, a uh, free speech is always important, but it's especially during hard time that we really need it. And if you go back in history, the First Amendment was written after a time of crisis during the Revolutionary War. So it's clear that the authors of this great document uh, sort of, they didn't say, okay, we have freedom of speech because we are living in such a great uh, situation. It was, we just went through this major crisis and we really need to have freedom of speech. Yeah. So just drawing a hard line uh, with uh, the government should really only be involved with things that are explicitly illegal. Um, that's that's a pretty clear line. Um, the the With regards to pandemic policy as we reflect and try to improve on what what happened over the past four years a lot of these things are now in the rear view thankfully masks lockdowns and so forth really the the main live issue at this point is the vaccine um and there there have been changing views of the vaccine as more and more data has come in where what is your overview of the mRNA vaccines, like what what do you think um, is the best public health use of the this kind of revolutionary technology at this point? Well, if they go back to the randomized trials, so there were randomized trials before they were got the emergency use. So it's good that were randomized. Uh, it's good that some people got the vaccine and other people got the placebo. Mm -hmm. uh, which is basically a shot in the arm, but without uh, any of the uh, vaccine in, in the shot. Uh, so that was good, but the clinical trials were not done properly. Uh, they were designed to evaluate symptomatic inf COVID infection. But I don't really care too much if you have to be home for three days in bed. I care about you not dying or also not being hospitalized. Yeah. But they recruited a lot of people, but they recruited mostly young and middle-aged adults. And they're going to survive COVID no matter what, uh, the vast majority of them. So there was not enough death uh, in, in these trials to actually determine if they reduced death. And in the Pfizer trial, there was about the same number of, uh, of deaths in the vaccine and the placebo group. So there was no evidence that this protected against death. Uh, so uh, you would say, okay, if it protects against infection, maybe it protects against death as well. Well, that's a reasonable assumption to do 
at least among older people who are at high risk of dying, but they could also be adverse reactions that leads to death. Mm -hmm. So uh, they made a mistake not to to look at actually older people, to look at death as an outcome, and they made a mistake to, to end the trial too soon. They didn't have that enough follow-up. So now we're in a situation where there are somebody put out a paper claiming that 17 million people died because of the COVID vaccine. Another paper claimed that 14 million people were saved by the COVID vaccine. But neither of those are reliable because we don't even have a proper trial, randomized trial to determine whether people uh, were, uh, if this reduced death or not. Hmm. Now, uh, there's a, group, a vaccine group in Denmark uh, who does excellent research. Uh, led by Christine Stable Ben at the Southern uh, Danish University or the University of South Denmark. And they took the randomized trials for the mRNA vaccine and pulled them together. And then they took the randomized trials from the adenovirus vaccine and pulled them together. That's Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and Sputnik mm -hmm. to do two pool analysis. And by doing that, they increased the sample size so you can say something about uh, death. And for the mRNA trials, there was no reduction in death or no excess death in, the, in these trials. So this is short term for younger and middle-aged adults. There were no benefit in terms of death from the mRNA trials. The Dinovarovactus trials, there was at least a 30% reduction in death based on the confidence interval. So uh, based on that, it seems that we gave people the wrong vaccine. We gave them the mRNA vaccine instead of uh, the Dinovar vector vaccines. Uh, but of course, that's only short term and uh, among young and middle aged people. Among older people, I think that probably all the vaccines did reduce mortality uh, during 2021 based on observational studies uh, done in various countries. Uh, for children and young adults, uh, I think we don't know whether it, it, uh, it uh, saved more people or killed more people. Uh, so is there a, a policy rec I, I mean, it sounds like you want more uh, randomized controlled trials on this specific question. Um, and are you suggesting that they that they actually are taken off the market until those trials are completed? So we're now in a different situation because now we're doing a booster for people who have had, most people have had the vaccine and or, or um, had COVID. So we're now in a different situation. So the original trial is not necessarily relevant for the boosters, but they haven't done a, even a proper randomized trial for the boosters. So yeah. what they should do, and for example, Dr. Vinay Prasad at the University of California, San Francisco has been really pushing this hard. Uh, they should do a randomized trial on the boosters and they should do it for all the people, people in the 70s and 80s and 90s to see if it reduces mortality in yeah. all the people who all of them have had either the vaccine or the uh, or infection before, because we don't uh, know if it reduces mortality or not in this group. The, but it may, it may, maybe it does. Yeah. But maybe it doesn't. The the counter that you always hear to this is that the real world data, the fact that we vaccinated billions of people across the world, um, indicates, it, it, and you can kind of see the outcomes from that, that it indicates that yeah, there's been the the vaccine saved a lot of lives. I mean, th this is the chart that uh, I, you know, controversially uh, pulled up when I was talking to RFK and there was a lot of uh, interesting discourse around it, but um, it's pulling from CDC data and shows, um, you know, the, the orange line here are the unvaccinated and the lines below are people who received at least one, some two vaccines. Um, and during that surge, you see a large spike in deaths among the unvaccinated and not so much among the vaccinated. And so it's data like this that these models that you were talking, these mathematical models that you were referencing that say, you know, millions of people have uh, been saved by the vaccine. They're extrapolating from data, real world data like that. Um, is that somehow not valid or or good enough to infer that from? Uh, so I think that uh, in 2021, when you saw this big peak in the unvaccinated, yeah. in 2021, I think the COVID vaccines did save uh, uh, lives among older people. 
-hmm. And I think there's actually better data than this. This is sort of just the graph, but there's individual data where you look at like cohort studies where you compare individuals who got the vaccine or who didn't, uh, you adjust for a number of various factors. So I believe that in 2020, uh, there was the, the vaccine saved the lives of older people based on observational data. We should have had randomized data for it, but we don't. So, uh, uh, yeah. But I think the, the observational data is really convincing that it saved people. Uh, at the same time, if you look at the right part of this, there's not much mortality in either group. Uh, and that's probably because everybody has some form of immunity, whether they were vaccinated or not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the question there is, that will boosters help or not? Right. Um, and there should be a randomized trials to determine that. Well, so I'm I'm in Florida and the policymakers here have taken a different path on many things related to COVID, uh, but also the vaccines um, in October 2022, the state surgeon general, Joseph uh, Lapido, announced that he had already recommended against the vaccine for children, anyone under age 18. Um, and then in October of 2022, based on a study that he conducted that's received some criticism, it's not peer reviewed, uh, but he said that he was recommending against the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines for males age 18 to 39 years old, based on um, doc, in his study finding an elevated risk of cardiac issues, myocarditis, and, and so forth. Um, just to give the full picture here for everyone, because I'm not weighing in on this one side or another, the CDC and Lapido exchanged uh, letters on this, and they say that the risk of stroke and heart attack is actually lower in people who've been vaccinated, not higher. Uh, based on their their uh, analysis of VAERS data. Uh, I don't know how much that's, I don't think that's highly stratified by age or sex, which seems like it could be a problem. But um, you, I, I'm curious, like, what do you think of, you know, the, 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 these are the real policy questions on the table now. Do you have any opinion one way or another on these sorts of policy recommendations? Uh, yeah, so I have a, a son, oh, my oldest son is in that age bracket, and mm -hmm. I don't think he should get the vaccine, uh, the booster. So uh, I, I don't think there's any reason for this age group to get the booster. So I agree with Florida in that respect. Uh, as for the two studies, the Florida study, it has some flaws in that study, but I think the conclusion that young men and young women do not need the boosters, I think is accurate. We know that there are adverse reactions. They are, they, we know that they can be myocarditis. That's a well-established fact that also CDC acknowledges. Uh, and we know that the, the benefit is, is minuscule in this age group. So uh, I agree with the uh, Florida recommendation not to recommend the vaccine to this age group. As for the VAERS data, that's very bad data. And uh, I'm surprised that they were referring to that. There, there are much better data on the CDC has on vaccine safety, like from the vaccine safety data link. Uh, mm -hmm. The vaccine safety data link has, has good data. The VAERS data is, uh, uh, is not very reliable for many things. I, you know, when we're thinking about the state of science right now, I've heard you in the past criticize kind of the state of peer review, um, you know, John Ioannidis uh, famously uh, uh, published this famous paper uh, in 2005, why most published research findings are false. Um, and one of his conclusions was that prestigious investigators may suppress via the peer review process the appearance and dissemination of findings that refute their findings, thus condemning their field to perpetuate false dogma. Empirical evidence on expert opinion shows that it is extremely unreliable. Do you agree with that? Um, or I guess more broadly, what is your view of kind of academia and, and peer, the peer review process? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, 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 and uh, I think we have a problem. Uh, we have, but Sunata Gupta, one of my co-authors for the Great Britain Regulation said is we have like a cartel system in science, not one for all of science, but each subset of science has a cartel system where the leading 
uh, established scientists control uh, who gets funded, who gets uh, published, and so on. And that's not a good thing. We have to decentralize science. We also have to open it up. So, for example, I think that peer review should be open. Hmm. Uh, how how would see. you do? How would you do that? What do you mean by open? Well, if I write a paper, uh, I'm publishing in some journal, and then it's reviewed. I think it's good to have it reviewed by other scientists. But I think that their review should be published together with the paper, so that other people can sort of see. Okay, Martin said this and that, but maybe there's a question mark here, or maybe he did this other thing completely wrong. Uh, so I think uh, now the and if it's open, also it's it's harder to sort of use that as a tool against your scientific enemies. Now it's all anonymous, so somebody can write something bad about this guy, uh, this thing, and unsubstantiated, and it's never known. It's just the paper is rejected and has to go to a different journal. So the current system is very slow in terms of publishing things, and uh, it doesn't give the open debate, uh, which I think an open peer review system should have. So uh, hopefully we will be able to revise how the whole uh, scientific publishing industry operates. Obviously, it should also be open access so that anybody can read the scientific literature. Uh, there's a movement for open access that has been very strong in the last 20 years, which is very good. So, uh, but there are still many papers that are behind the paywall. So the, the scientists will, will uh, produce the paper based on uh, uh, research grants that the taxpayers are, are funding. And then it goes to a, a journal uh, for a big publishing house, and then they get people to review it for free, and then they put it up there and they charge people to read it, even though it was paid for by taxpayers' money. So that shouldn't happen. All scientific uh, should be free and open to the public. So we're not, not getting more. the thing we paid for, essentially. You're not, no. Hmm. What do you mean by when you said decentralized, uh, decentralized science more? Um, how would you achieve that? So one thing up, uh, interesting during the pandemic was that some of the big uh, uh, important studies uh, on masks or on uh, uh, if, uh, immunity from, from having had COVID versus uh, vaccines and so on came from countries that are small countries, but with very good scientists, like Denmark, for example, or Iceland or, or Sweden or Qatar. Uh, so we have very good scientists, uh, but they're sort of independent on the big funding st streams from uh, NIH in the US and from the UK funding agencies, including the Wellcome Trust. So uh, some of the best research came from there. And I think that was because they're not as financially dependent on, uh, on these big funders. And Anthony Fauci, as the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, he was sitting on the biggest pile of infectious disease research money in the world. So it's very scary to contradict him because of that. So I'm thinking, I mean, the US is a big country. So instead of having one NIH, we could have six NIHs in different regions. And if then one is led by Anthony Fauci, well, that's too bad. But at least we have five other ones that are operational. So by decentralizing, if one thing doesn't work, then uh, there will still be other things that are working. You know, speaking of Anthony Fauci, the question that's on a lot of our minds, those of us who were disturbed by what unfolded during the pandemic, is this question of uh, accountability and, um, w you know, whether or not um, there's going to be any political accountability for any of the poor decisions the for the censorship. Um, it it kind of seems as though it's fallen off the political radar as we go into 2024. I mean, Donald Trump was in charge of the federal government when this all went out, and he's you know gliding to nominate to renomination. Uh, Joe Biden is the figurehead uh, of the Democratic Party who kind of continued and exacerbated the problems that Trump started. Um, I'm not particularly hopeful that there's going to be any sort of like grand reckoning, but uh, are are you, do you see any signs for optimism on that front? Uh, like you, I'm pessimistic if for any sort of official reckoning or commission or mea culpa, I don't think that's going to happen. Bit. Oh, you don't? Uh, okay. 
I don't think that's going to happen. So I'm pessimistic on that. What I'm what I'm optimistic is that I think the public has realized what a big huge mistake this was. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it's the majority now the public. And I I sometimes when I meet a random person, I will ask them. They don't know who I am, so I'll just ask them what their view is, and they will always ask, "Oh yeah, that was completely ridiculous." Uh, so they understand this. So they are very, very positive. And I think that if they ever try to do these lockdowns again, they won't succeed because there's already an organized uh, uh, sort of resistance to it. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if people became um, more sort of accidentally, the backlash was that they became more liberty loving and freedom appreciating than they were before um, in parts of the Anglosphere. I wonder how Australians reacted to their government really significantly curtailing their civil liberties. I wonder what some of the backlash to the Canadian trucker uh, movement has looked like. I wonder whether there's an awful lot of normal people who are sort of hiding in plain sight who are basically saying, oh my God, my kid has been struggling with learning loss for years after that the lockdowns were absolutely not worth it or, Oh, I ended up actually getting, you know, the virus and it really wasn't that bad. And I'm, I'm grateful that the old people in my life were protected from it. But like, I was afraid of something that was unreasonable to be afraid of. And it was because the government tried to instill a hysteria. And in reality, you know, a lot of that was um, baseless. I wonder how many normal people have walked away with a greater appreciation for their civil liberties than they had before. I think uh, many people have. That's my guess. Um, we, I'm, I was taking freedom of speech for granted. I don't take that for granted anymore. Hmm. So, well, Martin Koldorf, I want to thank you very much for talking with us today um, and for you know what you uh, did uh, throughout and after the pandemic. And you know maybe Harvard will reconsider its actions. Um, uh, Zach's going to keep emailing them every day on your behalf. Yes. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll follow. I'll follow up with them uh, <laughs> to to all all of our uh, listeners. Uh, just a reminder that you can email us uh, questions or topic suggestions at just asking questions at reason com. We'll be back here next week. See you then. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.